boys, yeah, that boy. Can you bring out your boys? Okay, I'll bring it. Go ahead. They're over here. They're right here.
So, I what? <laughs> go to sleep. <laughs> so, what, was, uh, what I thought I'd do tonight is quickly go through this Pullman presentation, which is not specifically Rutman, Rutman and then switch from there. This is sort of the, the background information. I learned a lot of stuff in it, so hopefully somebody will, people will see stuff they don't know. Um, and then we'll switch to Pullman operations on the Rutland, um, because I tried to bring them closer to home to just help explain what was going on. And I think I figured out the logic of passenger operations. I get Nimke's book, he says he can't figure it out, but it's, there, there's a logic back there to it. So Pullman, I'm going to look at my notes a little on this one because it's been a year, but um, you know, most of us know what Pullman is. When I gave this presentation in uh, Manchester, there were a mess of high school kids from Proctor that came down. And to that generation, um, you know, they may not know what Pullman is all about, or what, I mean, even know what the word means. It's pulmonary something that has to do with hearts, right? <laughs> um, so this is, you know, we, we better remember what this is before it's gone. But a hundred years ago, Pullman was at the height of, of peak and power. I mean, this was, Pullman was a major company. Their overnight guests in a year numbered about a fifth of the population of the country. And in any single night, they typically had 175,000 guests per night. Think of a hotel chain that does that. They were a serious operation. The country moved by rail back then and slept in Pullman's. In, in the beginning, rail traffic, rail travel wasn't easy. Uh, it, it was just a, a feat to get it working, and people really weren't thinking about comfort as much as safety. You know, can we get there in one piece, and or is it going to work? Uh, lunch stops were, you, know, you, you stopped, you ran off, and, and got in, got a bite to eat. There was a flyer from White River Junction. You know, the, the train will wait at White River Junction. Um, comfort wasn't a big thing. Speed wasn't either. And the original idea of stagecoach stopped for the night. But trains didn't really need to stop. I mean, early on, people started seeing the potential for sleeping in, in trains. Um, I think as early... In 1829, there was a proposal for a rail car outfitted as a sleeping barge. We <laughs> could see what they were thinking. Um, and in 1838, the first sleeping cars um, were running on the Cumberland Valley Railroad, but they weren't comfortable. They were pretty bare bones. Um, George Mortimer Pullman uh, was born in March. 1831 in Brockton, New York, wherever that is. Um, he was trained by his brother to be a woodworker, and when they were widening the Erie Canal, he, he worked for a while uh, moving buildings back from the edge of the canal. Uh, he went out in 1855 to Chicago, uh, got a job raising buildings above uh, the level of Lake Michigan. Um, out there, he came, became convinced that sleeping car accommodations in the period had to be made more comfortable. Uh, in 1859, he rebuilt two coaches, number number nine and number 19, for the Chicago and Alton Railroad. Um, in 1859, they kind of did the trick, but they, they weren't anything special. He had this idea of an upper berth that would fold down and have keep the bedding overnight, so it was a place to store the bedding in the upper berth when it was folded up. And that was a radical new concept. People had just had these fixed things before or something that folded down, um, with, particularly with a lot of hardware hanging in the cars. 1860, he moved out to Colorado, got involved in, in uh, silver mining, and <coughs> acquired a bit of capital that he could work with. 1863, he returned to Chicago, and in 1865, he completed Car A, Pioneer. Uh, there were, Pioneer was pretty, pretty spectacular, luxurious, had a couple of problems. 
It was too big to operate because it was a foot wider and two and a half feet higher than anything else on the Chicago and Alton Railroad. It didn't fit. So it kind of sat around and, and uh, the, big, the big sort of breakthrough on it though, it was luxurious, is that the hinged upper berths didn't have pipes that stuck down in the way, which was a major breakthrough for him. Um, his real break came when um, President Lincoln was shot. And tradition has it that Mary Todd Lincoln had seen the pioneer, was absolutely captivated by it, and when the funeral train was to proceed out to Springfield, she requested that the pioneer be used. Um, and you know, what are you going to say to the, to the first lady? So they, they got the saws out and they widened the platforms and cut back the overhang and, and it ran. And, and now after that, uh, Lincoln, or rather, um, some of the other uh, characters of the time, uh, Grant, I think, a few others, they, they all said, I mean, this is the fanciest way to travel, so they all requested it, and it kind of had set a standard. So at that point, they had to widen things to make it work. And any, any hosting railroad, if President Grant was going to go on it, you had to widen it up. Um, So I'm starting pointing stuff here. You notice that they're starting to push the Pullman name. Pullman was Pullman had realized that if if he could come up with quality, um, he, he figured that the, the public the public was ready to accept that they. Um, the idea of quality with, with train travel. If they could, if you could have the comfort of your home and a bit of luxury, that people would be willing to pay for that. And that was his, his basic premise. And um, so he, he started uh, working on better cars, fancier cars, and the thing to look at in the next, the next few pictures is, got really involved in, in you know, comfort in cars and everything else. I'm going to go sort of go through the, the Pullman era, looking at both the exterior, which we all understand, but also looking at terms of the interior, in terms of look at it as architectural style, as interior design. These cars were built as the state of the art at the time, and if it was out of style, people weren't riding it. So you didn't you would think now, oh, let's ride in this beautiful antique car. Nope. This was the newest and the best. And you'll see how styles change over time. There was a continual development. He would, uh, as soon as a car was out of date, it would get relegated to lesser service, they'd build new ones, or they'd renovate the older car. Travel by Pullman just captured the nation in terms of, you know, th this was the way you did it. He had. The, the night, the same car at night. They had uh, you know, parlor cars, uh, smokers. And so every different kind of service had a special car for it. It's not just a sleeping car. Um, and this is this is the. Uh, after the Civil War, things were things were booming, and the cars were pretty elegant. I just can't imagine how much maintenance it must have taken to keep these cars going. I mean, look at the, look at the woodwork in there. Look at the inlay work. I noticed the train line down the middle too. I thought that was kind of nice. The cord. Is that 
I don't dare go backwards. <laughs> Go forward. Um, again, interiors, and you'll see just, I mean, it may be some differences, but you go the right way. That's what the numbers say. There you go. All right, that's what I was It's George. The, the genius, quick, what's that station? Manchester. Manchester. Thank you. It's Manchester. Now, did it do it right? Well, the service. And from the Pullman. He didn't just build fancy cars and sell them to the railroad. He, he ran them too. And it was the Pullman service, the Pullman porter, the Pullman steward. And no matter where you were, whether it was on Manchester, Vermont, the deep woods, or whether it was on the 20th century, you got the same service from, from the Pullman employee. And that was really the, the, the genius. It was, it was quality and it was standardized. There were, there were booklets that were incredibly thick. I think I read somewhere that opening a beer took something like seven distinct steps to order a beer. It wasn't just pop there you go. And, uh, and that was a lot of the quality of it, or the, the genius of it. Is he just, it was this entire thing. If you went home and you knew what you were getting the best and you had were top quality. He also it opened up opportunities for African Americans that when most companies were not hiring African Americans, he did. And that offered him, there's a whole other story there that I don't know what I'm about to get into. Now I'm back to interior, so we've got to wait and see what happens. <laughs> Labor action in the 
19th century, uh, President Grover Cleveland called out the federal troops to move the mails. They were messing with the federal government by not moving passenger trains. There you go. The strike was, was broken, but so was Pullman. And his health was, I think he was just sort of devastated that his vision of being the paternalistic father didn't work out. Uh, his health deteriorated and uh, he died in 1897. In the meantime, they had called in general counsel for, for Pullman, who was Robert Todd Lincoln, who was the son of President Lincoln, who was a lawyer in Chicago. And he took over uh, the presidency of, of Pullman uh, when, when George could no longer do it. And he ran until 1911. So he was this transition period between wood and steel. Um, he had it built a summer house in Manchester. And if any of you are down that way, it's, it's worth a visit. We have an exhibit this summer on, on the Civil War, Manchester and the Civil War. Um, and I'm pushing them hard to try to play the Pullman card. They played the Civil War card, the Lincoln family, everything else, but they're not pushing Pullman. Well, Robert Todd Lincoln was a big deal in Pullman. And I think they have another sort of approach they should take. And so, if you go down there, ask where the Pullman stuff is. We'll see if we can twist our arms a <laughs> bit. This was the, the period of the switch when um, there were issues of safety, there were issues of maintenance, um, and Pennsylvania Station was built in 1910. The Pennsylvania Station outlawed wooden cars because of the fire hazard of the tunnels. So they had to make a switch. And he made that decision. This is Garrison, a wooden car, 1907. This is Jamestown, the first steel car of 1907. Still looks like a wooden car, just general trust run. Steel siding and even scribing, it looked like wood. Um, but it was an enormously expensive undertaking. They had to have new shops, new equipment, new skills for people. Um, but this started the great steel fleet. And, um, and again, they kept on the continual upgrading. They, they, would, they built cars, the steel cars started in 1907, but they were continually um, modernizing. We'll get into a little of that later. These are some steel cars uh, starting about 1909, uh, just a variety. You see, yeah, and the, unfortunately, this is great that we can actually see it, but the quality of the pictures, you may not get the feel for the interior design. But again, they were following the, the, uh, the fashions of the period. Not sure you can see some of the the pilasters next to the doors. Looks like some swags up here. It's in the, the lights. It was in a colonial revival period, and you're starting to see this reflected in the kind of car interiors. No, do you have any idea about coloring of the interior? Because there's cars of that era survive. When you go in now, they're all painted gray or you know Penn Central green, and they look very drab. A number of them in this early period were wood grained on steel. See a few pictures. Go wood finish. Go wood finish. But that last one wasn't. It wasn't. Color. No. And my guess but, is, but was it all of, one color or was it varying color? I, I think it was varying colors. You can sort of look at the pictures up close. But I think you know, if, if you look at the architectural period, I think you get a, the clues yeah. probably from architecture to the same period that Georgian revival, colonial revival. This is um, one of the early steel cars uh, with. Very early air conditioning. You uh, back this ice cart up to it, blew a whole lot of cold air in before the people got on and hoped for the best. <laughs> now here's what then they I mentioned the rebuilding. They would take older cars, the 1913 car. By the 1920s, both the style of the car and the, the specific needs of, of how they were set up would have changed. So they modernized it, they put air conditioning in it, and they changed the configuration around. Same body though. Now here's one that's wood grain. 
Even Standard, though, even though that's all steel. It's all steel. Yeah. And then I'm sure that was painted out later on. It was all painted to look like wood, but it was was And there, you know, up in Fair Story, you can see they've done some striking uh, yep. contrasting colors. And I imagine that was sort of a creamy, off-white, would be my assumption. You notice on this one, the broken scroll pediment over the door, the, the lights here, some of the... Uh, I think that's actually a grill in the ceiling, but but the colonial revival details of the period showing up in the cars. Checkerboard floor pattern. Yeah. yeah. Now this one's interesting. This was in the, the Havana in the Florida train, and so the car was decorated. That you started your vacation when you got on the car. You know, you're already in the. You know, you're headed towards Florida, and you're going out on the. Uh, all the way out, take the boat to Havana. So, how many DC 10s do you see now that they decorate the interior until the roots are gone? <laughs> this was one of the, the Western trains. You know, it's had sort of a Spanish Moorish detail on it. Came in with the Southern Pacific or Santa Fe, but it was, you know, again, they, they decorated it when the car was not in the general service pool. But specific to a railroad, <coughs> they would decorate it accordingly. It's time, time's went on into the 30s. The streamlined trains were coming on. They had this great steel fleet. They would uh, modernize the trains, make them into a streamlined look so they would blend with the others, but the same old steel heavyweight underneath. Interiors became Art Deco. This is the kind of the question, you know, even if they didn't change the interior much, but look at the lights. We're not these, these sort of 1930s modern lights. The, uh, the lightweight cars starting in the, in the late 30s, the 40s, 50s. Um, still, Pullman was still in the game, but Going back for a second, they they had made some business decisions just before the Depression, one of which was buying standard steel cars, so it became Pullman Standard. Those were good business decisions, but they really hurt them financially because of the, the Depression came in. Uh, things slowed down with the uh, Depression, train orders, train travel. Uh, things were slower. Train travel in general was, was uh, in a downhill slide. Um, there was an antitrust suit that had been going on for a while. It started in 1940. 1944, it was a decision against Pullman. There was a monopoly. You own the cars, you run the cars. It's, there's no place. Well, it had been a monopoly. I mean, Pullman had built this. He either bought out his competition or put him out of business. And uh, that's not what he did. The last One of the last big ones was the uh, New Haven. Sold him all their wooden equipment when, when the station... Penn Station was open because they couldn't afford to re-equip everything with steel. And they, they was one of the big last ones to move over. He bought out um, uh, Wagner in 1899. That was the last independent company. Um, but things were winding winding up. Uh, so in uh, 1948, Pullman sold uh, 2,367 cars. They kept the number, but they weren't a monopoly anymore. They sold them to their operating railroads. In a lot of cases, they operated them for the railroads, um, but they were hired back to do it. But it was getting to be the end. The 1960s were kind of the end of the standard cars. They were, they were around, but they were starting to look and feel their age. And, and you know, we were headed towards Amtrak. Um, and, it, and in uh, January 1st, 1969. The Pullman Company, as an operator of passenger car uh, operations, went out of business, and that was that was the end of Pullman. It's been a little over 100 years. Um, as I mentioned before, 
I'm, I'm trying to lean on Hill Dean to see if they they uh, should push the Pullman thing. Green Mountain has this old Pullman in, uh, which I think was a CN car and then uh, CB work car. Uh, needs a lot of work, but I don't think it's air conditioned. Unless it's one of these air conditioning ones that they put underneath. See, do you know? Looks well, pretty fun air conditioned to me. And so I figured because of Canadian service and, and, and kind of a tourist car that it not, did not get air conditioned. So that's an example of really a 1920s car that ought to be preserved. Um, it's never modernized. So again, let's lean on on uh, Hill Dean. Now, now we'll switch if we can switch to the next. Technical work here. I couldn't. I wasn't smart enough to figure out how to combine my two programs. So the second one. Unfortunately, if there are accurate records of Pullman operations on the Rutland, um, nobody seems to have found them yet. So what we have is we have snapshots. Uh, conductor William Shakespeare was taking very detailed notes. 1939, I guess, late 1946, somewhere in there, um, with car names and routes and everything else. Um, other people took photographs and recorded um, car names when they were on the line. So we have these snapshots at various times, plus timetables. So we can sort of put together a picture. I don't pretend to think that this is anywhere near the last word. I'm just sort of trying to, I learned a lot trying to figure out the operation. So if anyone has things to add in, Jump right in here. This is not not publishable yet. <laughs> Let's first talk about schedules. Um, I think over the years, Rutland operations stayed relatively constant. There was the the New York route, from New York to Montreal. And the Boston route from Boston to Montreal with a spur out to Ogden's route. Um, and, and that, over the years, with variation, seems to have stayed fairly constant. The, the New York route was a competitive route. If you look at it, it's fairly straight. There weren't a lot of other options. You'd come over here and then up to, C, up to CV, or you could go up to D&H. But this was fairly direct. And so over the years, that one was, the, the, in the end, particularly the better route. The Boston route, there were, there were other lines. There were other lines with better service. So it was always a secondary route. They never put air-conditioned sleepers on the, on the Boston section. It was always older equipment. Not to say that the service wasn't as good, but it wasn't the best service, it wasn't the best equipment, because you could, you could ride the CV or the CN and, and, uh, and be ahead of the game. The line to Ogdensburg, they used, if the Boston to Ogdensburg line, that was competitive. If you were going to Ogdensburg for Boston, I'm not sure why you'd want to, but I guess, <laughs> um, that, I guess because, to stay in Boston. <laughs> except on Sunday night. There was this whole thing about everything else was straightforward. The Boston route always had to have Sunday schedule and the rest of the week schedule. And they didn't go to Ogdensburg on Saturday night. Maybe there's not the in Ogdensburg on Saturday night. That I don't know either. But it was, um, this was a connection, and I guess because it was a, a, a late port and uh, green, there was business out there, but that, that had a sleeper for quite a while when you think, why would you, why would you join up that line? Um, then to break it down further, there were day trains and night trains. And so if the, the uh, on the day train, you either rode coach or they put parlor cars and parlor buffet cars on buffet would serve you a little bit of lunch. Um, and then during World War II, Pullman sold a number of older heavyweight cars to the New York Central and they converted them into reclining seat coaches, which was sort of a first class coach. New York Central always seemed to do a good job of putting good equipment on the New York line. They, they often put the New York, the uh, reclining seat coaches on, they had air conditioning, they were advertising in the 30s, mid-30s, there was air conditioning equipment on that line. 
Um, but never a streamlined car. No, I, I just thought of one thing about the Boston dog is very sleeper. It wasn't a New York dog is very sleeper. Because right. the New York Central ran that route. Oh, yeah. Right. There are other, if you were in New York City, there are other ways to get to Ogdensburg. Well, there's always but, one other way. <laughs> the Canyon Reaper? But, well, it was more than that back then. And right. also, in Ogdensburg, at New York Central, Ogdensburg? Yeah, I had a bridge that went across. No, no, that was a ferry. That was freight on there. A freight ferry. Freight ferry. But not for passengers. Now, I have a picture of, <clears throat> on the Messina line, you go to New York Central Dine Tables. They had a train that left Messina and went to Ottawa by train. And I have a picture of the bridge prior to the seaway that showed horses, people and trains going across there with those ocean liner in the background before the new bridge that they put across there, the upgrade. But there was a railroad crossing and it was a sweet Why bridge. Bruce Curry, where are you? That was not Ogdensburg, that was at Cornwall. Oh, well, yeah. Call up, okay. <laughs> I stand corrected. But Jeff, I think you're right. The, the, the secret was if you were going from Boston out to upper New York State, that was the route you wanted to go. Right. Oh, I suppose you could have come across here, and, uh, but, but that's why I think it was competitive. And, and there was no reason for New York. Sorry. Um, the Boston to Montreal line, it, the day train, the parlor cars came off 1936, 1937. It, they used to run, everyone's seen the picture of the Rutland. It should be up front, I think. Uh, yeah. Everyone's seen pictures of the Ru the Rutland Diner, the wooden diner park in Rutland. They ran that on the um, Auburn to Boston run opposite a B and M car on the um, um, uh, we'll get to the train. I think it was on the flyer. And they ran that until 1931, 32, and then apparently there wasn't the business for that anymore. So they simply went to um, parlor cars with a uh, boiler buffet situation, and even those were off about five years later. They just were, what didn't seem to have been the business? I'm sorry, 30, 39. Also, after the uh, buffets went out of out of service, some of the schedules said there was sandwich service. Uh, I don't know if it was to Burlington or North Burlington, so you could buy sandwiches. Well, it was head feed for somebody. Was that provided by a news butcher? Well, it's in, it's in the uh, front of the schedule telling you what's on the train. So I don't know who specifically sold it, but it was sandwich service was available. Bill, did Pullman operate their own cars? <coughs> yes. Did they, they stacked? Yes. So how did they interact with, like, the home railroad's crew? Do well, you know any of them? I, I know often, for instance, when they put together, <coughs> let's say at Rouse's Point, when they when they combined anything that had come from Og when the Ogdensburg train came in, they combined them. The Boston sleeper and the New York sleepers would be on the back. Then the New York cars, then the Boston cars, and head end cars, uh, head end cars were up front. Because then when they got to Rutland, they could pull the the uh, Boston sleeper off the back and pull the head end cars off and it was easier to separate it out but they always kept the sleepers together because that was that was Pullman that was you went in there you dealt with Pullman. And there was only one place that they had to keep the coach passengers trying to go into the sleepers. Right. Yeah. If we look at a few and, and the, the obvious for a sleeper lasted until 1940, as far as I can tell. If we look at a few timetables, we can see we thrash through those. Thrash away. 1929, and I'm not sure you can read this. You can read it on the thing. Can't read it on? All right. Let's see if I can. The, the Rutland, let's go back to the map then. I guess the map would be good. Backwards? Yeah. <laughs> if you go backwards, you're going to have two inputs. 
Um, the, um, the, the, the trick in figuring out the Rutland operations, I think, was they had feeder trains and they had their main trains because they had local business and they had through business. So if you had the train going to the, the Mount Royal, say, going to uh, from New York to <coughs> Montreal, if you stopped at every hamlet along the way, you were going to drive your through passengers away. So they, they had secondary, the Northern New, Northern New York Orc Express, the uh, Troy Local, the Rutland Local, the Alberg Local, they all, and the names changed over time. But basically they had the speeder trains. So when the, the uh, Mount Royal New York section got to uh, Rutland, they would pull off the Burlington sleeper. They would add in whatever Boston cars were there, but at the end, you, I, I was really confused because the Mount Royal didn't have a sleeping car in 1946. And I said, it's got it, it's an overnight train. But the Northern New York Express had a sleeping car because it was the Burlington sleeper. There was that point, there was no through traffic sleeping car all the way to, to Burlington from, or to uh, Montreal from New York. Sorry, Boston. But there was local traffic. So they would, they, trains left it was a combined train. It was the, the Mount Royal and, and the Northern New York Express left Boston together. And then at Rutland, they split. And the sleeper stayed with the local train and stopped at Middlebury and Brandon and everywhere up the, the road as far as as, um, as Burlington. The New York cars, the, the through sleepers, next stop was Burlington. They didn't stop anywhere in between. So they just took their passengers and shot them right on through. But a local, a Burlington sleeper that was on the New York train got pulled off and stuck on this local train. So they, they fed their local stops through local trains and tried to keep the through trains going through. So you look at the timetable and there are all these odd names that don't mean anything to us now. What was the, the Rutland Local? The Rutland Local wasn't necessarily just a coach that ran down independent. It was a feeder train for their main, their through trains. And, and then they had a lot of seasonal stuff. And I think if you click through this, some of these, we, unfortunately we can't see them because it showed the dining car, where it was and then when it was off and it showed sort of other, you can kind of track equipment through the things, but why don't we just jump to the, um, the 39, 32, 36, 38, or 39, 40, 41. Now, there's something interesting I found on here. We'll go back the, to, um, it was on, on the 1940 timetable. This will we keep going, we'll get to it. Bingo. Who ever heard of the Equinox? Well, they were running the second section of the flyer on Friday afternoons in July and August to Manchester. It went to Rutland, but it, I mean, with the name the Equinox, guess where it's going. And it was for the summer track. And my father used to talk about taking the train down because they also have sleeping car services. It was very specific. It started after the 4th of July and it ended at the, at the end of uh, August. But it was for <coughs> summer business. They were, making a t they were making a valiant attempt to try to capture this. And the sleeper would be taken south through Manchester, I don't know, seven or eight o'clock at night by the Troy local set off at Manchester. <coughs> then the Troy Local continued on its merry way. You could occupy the sleeper after 10 o'clock at night. So passengers headed back to New York for Monday morning work, come over Sunday night, take your sleeper berth. Mount Royal would pick the car up in the middle of the night, and off you would go and end up in Grand Central Station Monday morning, time for work. They only stayed throughout the summer, the father went home to work week. Yeah, exactly. But he came up for a month, and a husband only got a you know a week or two off. You stayed up for the rest of the time. And this is how you did it. And that was summer only. Summer only. So they didn't need a scene. Right. Right. It also I'm not sure. This is where I I didn't have time to look at all the timetables to try to figure it out. And I don't have enough timetables to figure it out. But I wonder if some of the traffic and some of the the logic for the Alberg sleeper was supplying um, summer traffic through the islands. I don't know. There's a you know, more more of a research question.
Now we'll quickly talk about equipment, and then I think everybody's head nods off. Shut up. Um, the, the specific equipment that that was on different trains does depended on the route. Um, this was an overnight train. The Mount Royal was an overnight train, so sections were popular. You just you just need to get a place to sleep for the night. So the, the cars that tended to be on the on the Mount Royal were were basic sleeping cars with ten section, one drawing room. Um, those got modernized into uh, ten twos. Then the later ones there were some eight fives and some double bedrooms in there. But they tend, if you go through the lists of equipment, it's predominantly the cars that had mostly sections. The, the room cars and stuff were popular in long distance routes. You go across the southwest, you settle in for a few nights, that was different traffic. So you can, it's not just any Pullman car, it was specifically the ones they wanted on this route were the sections. They tended to come on for a week or so, and then get cycled off. My guess was they went to get massively cleaned, or I'm not sure how they shifted it out. But you look at names, and they'll be names for a while, and then and then they're gone. But the replacement would be the same. But the floor same, plan. typically the same floor. Yeah. Okay. Day trains were parlor cars. There were a variety of different ones. This is this. 24 seat, unfortunately, I'm sorry, you can't see it real, but it's 24 seat, one, I think it's got a drawing room and a, and a, a broiler buffet. You can get something to eat. The ones I highlighted in yellow, which you can't read, were ones I know that were on the rubber from somebody's record. So you can get to see, there were a fair number of these cars. They were relatively common. A lot of these cars were on the Boston run. Whether or not they were ever modernized or when they were modernized, you see, these were when they were built in the teens. They had the clear story or the uh, transom window over the paired windows. Whether they got modernized or when they got modernized, I can't tell you without seeing specific pictures of the train. They put a white piece of steel on it, made it look more modern. Again, different uh, configuration. I think that's a 28 seat, uh, same parlor car, just a lot of seats. Uh, this is a 28-1, just to give you an idea of what the car looked like. Ro uh, round, rotating seats, there's some captain seats, type things. Look out the window, look, turn inward. No, I was just to say, if anybody wants to ride one, there's one in service in the Essex Railroad. Really? Beautiful car. Night trains. This is Rouse's Point, Montreal. Montre uh, the Montreal train. Now, 12-1 was 12 sections, one drawing room, and the plan two, uh, the 2410 were kind of the grandfathers of all this. They, they built, I'll give you an idea how many they built. Um, and then these cars, as time went on, they were rebuilt into other cars. Mm -hmm. So uh, the number you see here mm -hmm. aren't one of the cars that, that's, they didn't all survive until the very end. They were often modernized very quickly, the 1920s even. Now, just to give you an idea, those are all the, the lots of cars that they made. It, it, the, the numbers just show 50 cars in the general pool, 50 cars in the accident, or whatever. Now, these are the car names. The reason they named the cars, by the way, is they ran on different railroads. So if they numbered them, there'd be a conflict somewhere with some railroad. And you'd have two cars with a number, you know, 2052 or something. So they they named them, so there would never be confusion. Now these are car, these are lot numbers and the cars. And I started there are a few highlights. You'll see the cars I know they're on the Rutland. Uh, I got sick of reading. Just keep looking at them. These are all just 2410 plans, 1012, 10, 10 uh, 12 ones. made a few up? What is the number? I don't know. I didn't count. <laughs> there are a lot of them there. I was I was just trying to go through and try some of the names that that uh, rang the bell with me. Anyway, those were the grandfathers kind of, a, of the sleeping cars and they just they get, kept getting rebuilt and other stuff. Um, there's a there's a one that's been modernized with air conditioning. 
typical interior. And there's wood graining. And you get different seat materials. This is of that fabric I think they used that was <coughs> bulletproof. <laughs> this was a slightly different plan, similar car. Similar look. There's a bit of, you know, they, they, they still had architectural details to them. Just variations on the same car. These aren't even the 2410s. These are just the other cars. The uh, 10 twos, I think, were a, an improvement over the other ones. Um, a lot of these seem to have found their way under the the right lane. You see all the yellow marks there. But there weren't that many of them. It was only part of a page compared to the other the other ones. The you know, similar treatment of the the architecture in the car. The eight fives were a modernization with the five double bedrooms. And the six 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 were Six section, six double bedrooms. They weren't very common on the road, problem, but they were. They, at this point, these were all rebuilt cars. They tend to have a series, and these were the Poplar series. Now, those are all named Poplar something or other. Um, there were one or two of them that showed up on the road or something. Um, and the, the just interject. I think the reason those didn't show up very often is because they weren't intended to be regular. Service. And you know they had a reservation system that was all done on paper. And you know if you made a phone call, a local call, or you went to your local station to make a reservation, and they'd call the reservation center, which might be in New York City or I don't know where home might have you, and they'd pull out a card for that day on that train, and they'd expect a 12-1. Yeah. So. If, if they had 12 ones, that's what they had to run because that's how they were working the reservations. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, so eventually, if you showed up you know, else, by telegraph, they'd send the consist of you know who all the passengers were who were reserved to be riding on that car that <coughs> night. And if it was a different car, then pandemonium. On the CV, every station where we sold Pullman service, we had a diagram of the car. Yeah. Okay. And right. St. Albans with a loud couple of bedrooms of upper <coughs> doors and sections. And the same thing at Bonfrey Junction, Essex, and White River. So we could sell those without calling to them because they were assigned to that station. But once he did sell out, and then if he needed more space, you had to get back on the phone and call him. Yes, definitely. The, uh, some of the, the trains were the uh, Boston sections had the buffet lounge car, which had eight sections and then a lounge car at the end. So when you when you left Grand Central, you could ride up to Hudson, be a bit in style. Um, these were the, the um, Algonquin Club and the Exmoor Club showed up some on the road, particularly in the earlier 30s. Yeah. Nice nice way to travel. Nice way to uh, go across the causeway. On this. But like all things, everything got, comes to an end. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. They had the same similar service on the CV, but they had the local office at Albany until 304 on the block, left around 8 30, 9 o'clock at night. Don't get out of the room. Stop at every local station and picked up the local traffic. Dropped it at Wind River in the Washingtonian, picked it up there, and went to Washington. Yeah. Came back in the morning, same thing. So, yeah, I'm sure it wasn't roughly convention, but, no, but, but, but if you didn't know what they were doing, the timetable could sure look confusing. Yeah.